Hello. Today we are going to have a conversation on art and sacred space and the importance of beauty. My name is Karen Schmidt and I'm a liturgical sculptor and my studio is in Anaheim, California. Uh, I have sculptures in several churches uh, across the country. And I'd like to um, invite my, uh, my guests, our, we're all guests together, to uh, introduce themselves. Um, Roberta Amundsen and Peter Brandis. Roberta, would you begin? I'm Roberta Green Amundsen. I am, I am not an artist um, in the sense that I don't create any specific kinds of artworks. However, ever since I was a small child, I've loved art and interior design and table design. So I do those things, but I also um, have been a journalist, so I write and think and speak about the role of beauty and Christian faith in particular in culture around the world. So that's what I do. And I'm like Karen, I'm an artist. I'm a Danish artist, born in 44. And uh, I have been doing churches, uh, like uh, you said you have been doing, where I have been doing stained glass windows, sculptures, paintings, and uh, mosaic. I'm working in all techniques, so to say. Uh, I have been doing those churches in many different places, in Denmark, in Norway lately, and also here in this area, in the village of Hope, where I have done some uh, stained glass windows, and I have done a big jar because I'm also working with ceramic works. And uh, I'm extremely involved in trying to make the sacred space something vivid and contemporary. And this is, I think, what we're going to talk about also. Yes, yes, that's wonderful. Um, because we are developing a new, lang new languages, new ways of speaking about God and mm -hmm. art and the sacred, so. And we're here today in a way because some years ago, I go to Denmark every year. Um, sort of whether I need to or not, but I do need to. And um, I have a wonderful friend there who, who has been a guide, but she's a friend more than a guide. And she took me to see a church that Peter had done. And I was just blown away by the, uh, the wonder of the, the contemporary visual language that spoke so powerfully and was, was orthodox. It was truly deeply Christian. And I thought, who is this? And uh, my friend, Brigitte Pripp, found, she said, oh, Brandis, I know him, I know of him. He's been around forever. And um, anyway, <laughs> the long and short of it was I met Peter, and then my husband and I were deeply involved for many years and still are with the Orange County Rescue Mission who launched the Village of Hope, which was the first center for homeless families and their children in California. Wow. So we, they managed to get a chapel, and. I said, well, I, I, we could help you with that. And uh, so that, that brought Peter um, to California. And yes. so we've Wonderful. become friends yeah. through art it's true, and sacred yes. space. And uh, I mean, and you have played a, an important role in my uh, work as an artist because you had given me the possibility to do many beautiful things. Among other things, uh, made a chapel for you, which uh, is also is something that very few artists are invited to do to make a private chapel to a person and to get no limits whatsoever. I mean, you don't say to me, uh, please do that or that and that. I was completely free. And this is one of the things that we have to talk about also now, I think, is that when you get commissions for churches and when a church wants to have something which is other than just the text and the book which lies on the altar table, uh, then uh, uh, they could go to an artist. But the people who go to an artist can m ask them to do something. They are not artists often themselves, and right. they are not very knowledgeable often themselves, which is not a point that I can blame them, because uh, I don't know anything about carpenting, but uh, I know something about what I know. And uh, those people have maybe a love for art, and they have to be guided, you know, in some or another way. And if you get guided in the way that uh, you just follow uh, your heart and uh, your feelings, then often it is the best guide. But if you start to try to think about it too much and have ideas what is good and what is bad, then it's wrong. Uh, I want to give a little example because any church has to do 
when you do a decoration there with feelings. It, it is, if you don't have any feelings and it has to be also a religious feeling, then you shouldn't go into a church. Because then uh, making a sculpture for a factory is not the same as making a sculpture for a church. Right. And uh, then uh, uh, the feeling that you have there is a longing for something. A longing is a very, very strong feeling that people have in them. And the longing can be for peace and the longing can be for redeeming and it can be for so many things. But longing is one of the very, very strong. You have love and you have hate and you have jealousy and you have many other uh, human, uh, so to say, uh, uh, talents. But one of the great talents, in my opinion, is the longing for something. And the longing can be so strong that uh, it ends up in a reality. It means that you create something for your church. Longing for beauty. Yes. And uh, this is what I think is one of your ideas mm -hmm. also about mm -hmm. uh, doing, uh, helping and uh, putting uh, in reality uh, possibilities for artists to do art in churches. Yes. It's a longing for beauty is a longing for God. Yes. It it's is. a longing for that which is whole and beautiful mm -hmm. and, and life-giving. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think beauty is a, a a door or a window into that. Mm. It's, a, it's a talisman of hope mm -hmm. that there's the possibility of a brighter, better, mm -hmm. richer, deeper, um, more meaningful future. And it can help people see that they don't need to stay where they are, that there is the possibility mm -hmm. of a better life, a richer life, mm -hmm. a deeper life. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's the role that beauty plays and has played in the church forever, mm -hmm. yeah. taking people up mm -hmm. and out and beyond to God. Yes. Um, and beauty provides that. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, we live in an impoverished visual culture. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And the church, the church, in the, the Protestant church particularly in, in North America has a history of, 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 of pietism and of thinking that you shouldn't spend God's money to mm. build these, to, you know, to make beautiful things. It's the important thing is the community and the fellowship. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we live, we're visual people. Mm. Yes. And so we make visual things. And so there's a lot of ugliness oh, yes. <laughs> because people haven't cared yeah. and put the two together yeah. that they long for that. Oh, yes. That's why art museums become kind of temples. Yes. Because people long for it. Also. But I, I remember I had a, a, a reunion with people who were interested in sacred art in Denmark and there was an old priest who was now retired and he used to be a missionary priest in India. And then he said to me, oh Peter Brands, I just finished one of my huge churches and he said, how come? Why all this gold? Why all this fantastic colored windows? Why all this? I went to India and I had a callus which was a Coca-Cola box with, which was empty and we put the wine in there. And then I had an old basket of green plastic and we had the bread in that for, uh, the, for the patina. And uh, then we were sitting out under a tree, we had no church, and uh, then we had the Eucharistic meal. And the people were very happy and they blessed God that they had the chance to do that once a week. And they were like, we were talking for longing, they were longing for that every week. And uh, why do you need all the rest, he said. And this person, he was well dressed himself, uh, even very beautiful. I, I remember he had an Armani dress on and he had a wonderful tie. And I said to him, why have that beautiful dress on you have there? Why, is that some need you have in you to be well dressed? And uh, why, uh, why not just take a piece of cloth with a hole in and put it over your head? And then I tried to explain to him, like I remember I told you this story that in that area, in Denmark in the 11th, 12th century, you constructed in 100 years, 900 churches. Mm -hmm. And then you could ask you that, this question, how come that people have a need yeah. to do uh, 100 and 200 and 800 and 900 churches in such a, a very short term uh, of, of time, you know? And this is because they had this longing to do something out of, of themselves, which is yes. to honor a person that means more than anything else for them, which means a God, you know. So can you imagine what a devotion it is yeah. to do so many churches and work so hard? Yeah. 
because they already worked hard in the fields there because it was a tough country to work in and uh, the climate and everything. And still they had this extra plus to be able to do this devotion to God. And this is something you cannot explain because like faith is not explainable, then the devotion is not explainable. Yeah. And I mean this devotion is so important that uh, uh, even if it's wonderful to sit under a tree and have a green basket and some Coca-Cola cans with uh, the wine in, then it's also important to show that this person that we make this church for is not an ordinary person. And he is someone who has changed our lives. Yes, and deserves something yes. so much more. Yes. It's so much more. Yes. And so even if you start out with the Coca-Cola yeah. thing, then put together your pennies and, and <laughs> find something more beautiful mm -hmm. and something on that level we can still bring beauty in. I don't yeah. think um, cost is the only barrier to, no. to beauty, I think it's, it's our impoverished souls. I think yeah. that yes. that ignorance and, and a lack of vision is a very yeah. big part of that. And, and perhaps those people have not themselves experienced walking no. into a sacred space, a cathedral, no. where the light is coming through the windows, transforming the atmosphere. And you see the beauty and no. the images that evoke so much more than just mm. a cognitive, um, faith. I, I think it. it uh, we're taking something that is oh, yes. transcendent and, oh, yeah. and intangible, and with art we bring it onto a tangible yeah. level that we can, that we can see. And yet, with the kind of art that you mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Maya uh, produce mm -hmm. and, and create, it is. It, it's abstract and calls us. For, it it calls, calls yeah. us in to that longing. In, in both of it, and takes it to a deeper level yes. in, um, than if it was just something super realistic there's right a, there. There's a, a, a wonderful essay by um, a Roman Catholic philosopher named Dietrich von Hildebrand, who, uh, who was one of Husserl's two best students. The other was Martin Heidegger. <laughs> Martin Heidegger wound up a Nazi, and, and uh, Dietrich von Hildebrand spent the 30s and 40s, fleeing from the Nazis, um, and uh, started one of the first anti-Nazi newspapers. But he, he wrote and thought a lot about beauty. And uh, he, in a posthumously published essay called Beauty in the Light of Redemption, mm -hmm. um, which has a powerful message. I think that the, the Protestant church um, in, in North America needs desperately, is he talks about, I mean, we know we need to love God for the beauty of holiness. Mm -hmm. um, Jonathan Edwards wrote, if we just love God uh, because of what he does for us, mm -hmm. well, we don't really love God. We love what he does for us. Mm -hmm. It's utilitarian. Mm -hmm. We need to love God for who he is, mm -hmm. the yes. beauty of his holiness. Yes. And we have to see his loveliness mm -hmm. before we can love and worship mm -hmm. God, which mm -hmm. is a wonderful book written by an arch Presbyterian Calvinist. <laughs> um, but von Hildebrand then takes that argument as made when he starts this essay. And what he wants to focus on is what is the role of tangible objects, beauty, you know, glass, all those things, because those are the things under fire mm -hmm. in the 20th century, mm -hmm. as superfluous, as a waste of money, as, right. as, you know, the riches of the church, and it's all evil, it should go to the poor, and this stuff. And, and von Hildebrand really is having none of it. And this is a man spending good 15 years of his life mm -hmm. running or fleeing from, first from Berlin and then from Vienna. Um, and he, he says that, that, that um, he calls it beauty of form. He's a philosopher, you have to forgive him for that. But the beauty of form um, is a tangible witness mm -hmm. to the existence of God. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. you, it isn't being less spiritual to appreciate that mm -hmm. because the beauty of form in itself is a witness mm -hmm. and is a value in itself. Mm -hmm. And and then it, it also connects to mm -hmm. spiritual beauty and, and takes you there. Mm -hmm. But it's a good in itself, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. something that it's is an a message. It's an attribute of God. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it is who God is. Mm -hmm. And beauty that we appreciate and the ability to appreciate beauty 
that, mm. that longing mm. is a gift from God, and it's who He is and the mm. gift to us, mm. and that's what we, that longing mm. for beauty mm. draws us to Him. God made a lot of tangible beauty. Mm. Just look at the pictures from outer space. Oh, well, yes. I mean, this yeah. is not a being mm. with a lack of appreciation no. of the role of matter and color and beauty. Right. This, is, right. this right. is somebody who got it big time. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. universe is big, mm. and it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. It really is. I was thinking mm -hmm. about also when, when people start to create something for churches mm -hmm. and your community wants it. You have, of course, churches that have been built already. Yes. And then you put things in. And it can be old churches. It can be even from the 12th century. And then you put modern art in. And then it can be a completely new church where you have this cooperation with the architect and the community mm -hmm. from the beginning. And of course, these two things are two different things because with the old church, you have uh, witnesses from centuries and centuries, and you have in yes. one or another way to take care of those witnesses, yes. and you have to make a dialogue with those witnesses. It's uh, wrong if you try to contradict it completely or if you try to even destroy it by your work you put in a new church or an old church. And uh, this is uh, one of the tasks that an artist has when he is asked to do something to. For instance, I did uh, the main cathedral in Denmark, which is the Roskilde Cathedral, uh, where you have about 40, 50 kings and queens buried. And it is the history book of Denmark. And that cathedral is also being protected by UNESCO for um, eternity. We have three sites in Denmark, and this is one. And they asked me to do a new uh, entrance door there in bronze, which mm -hmm. is a huge door. Mm -hmm. And then they asked me to do a chapel in there. And that was, of course, a big challenge because you have this uh, task. You have a church full of history, full of art, and important yes. art, and then you have to be integrated there. And um, uh, what well, just to give you an idea of how I work, you know, was that um, I have made uh, the door in bronze, uh, and outside it has motives that I have worked with already in the church for Village yeah. of Hope here, where I made the 12 apostles symbols. Yeah. But I don't make the symbols like we know them. No. I mean, Peter, no. uh, you know him always uh, with the keys because he's the one who has the keys for heaven, and uh, that was one of the tasks he had at the end of his life to be able to do that, open the heaven for you. But uh, he is shown uh, in the way that you just have an ear. And the ear is the ear that he cuts off mm -hmm. when one of the soldiers uh, arrests Christ on uh, the, the day he's going to be later crucified. And uh, then, for instance, I have uh, Paul, you know, uh, Thomas, you always see him, of course, with his hand, and then Christ showing his wound. But there I just have the finger and the wound, you know. So I, I, I try to make a kind of science from the texts instead of making the whole figure and instead of showing the whole, so to say, episode in a narrative way, I make it as a significant way, which is sign, and, uh, and uh, then in your mind you have that uh, remembrance. Yes, like the foot of Abraham yes. in your window of oh, yes. Isaac, the sacrifice of yes. Isaac. Yes. represents yes. The the him yes. and the journey. Yes. Uh, and this is, of yeah. course, a little kind of modern way of approaching those things, mm -hmm. where you have all these wonderful images of the apostles from all the great artists uh, from yeah. the time of Dürer and then on, where you see them with their symbols. But uh, for instance, um, uh, then uh, Bartolomeo, you remember, he was uh, uh, sewn into pieces with a saw. So I make a saw, you know, with a, and then I make him also his face. But uh, this is how I work. But that is the outside door, which is dark, and uh, the bronze that goes with red bricks from those old bricks from the 12th century. And then um, inside I have also a door, which is the same size, and there it is golden and uh, shining. And there I have made a Christ sitting at the meal at Emos, mm -hmm. where he has the two disciples who suddenly realizes that when they uh, give him the bread that the person they walked with for so long and yes. couldn't recognize yes. he is Christ. Yes, in and English uh, we say um, the Emmaus, it's yes. the, the meal at Emmaus. Yeah. So. But then uh, my idea is that when you go into the church and you have a beautiful uh, 15th century altar piece there, mm -hmm. gold gorgeous. also, then uh, you get the bread and you get the wine, which is uh, 
the main thing in the whole mess, uh, yeah. so to say. Mm -hmm. And then when you go out after you had touched Christ in that way, uh, with the bread and the wine, and have been part of him, then suddenly you see the same thing that happened to the two disciples in Emos, that Christ is sitting there on the table. So this is the last view you have when you go out of the church. And my idea is that when you come out in the street, then around the corner every day and whatsoever, when it can be in the morning or the evening, you could meet him. And it's up to you yeah. to meet him, you know. Yes. Yes. And uh, this is what art can do. Yeah. You can make it in a text, yeah. but you can also do it with an image, you know, that you have this feeling, oh, will I meet him maybe when I come out? Will he sit tonight together with me around the table? Mm -hmm. Will the persons I have with me in this room be aware of that this is maybe a magic moment in my yeah. existence? Yes, yes. I, I think that's one of the great joys in creating liturgical yes. art. Yeah. is that you have a way of taking something that is familiar to most yes. people yes. and and presenting it in a way that may be a little more difficult to access, yes. but it causes people to want to figure it out. Yes. And when you begin to make the connections, and the art is in the context, mm. and that's what you're talking about, in the mm. context of this mm. place, mm. this particular place, mm. then you begin to pull these elements together. Yes. And it isn't even yeah. just your art well. that speaks, but it's the context that speaks, it's the actions and activities, the liturgy that mm -hmm. speaks, mm -hmm. and then the Holy Spirit puts it all together and you go out and it makes a difference in the way you serve. P Peter brings up a point because Peter was connecting the altar yes. to the door. Yes. And you participate, it's a pilgrimage. You go up to take the Eucharist, mm -hmm. but then when you go out, mm -hmm. you realize what it meant, Christ is present yeah. with yes. you now. Yeah. And we have a f another friend who, who is Russian, who um, is the, uh, the head of the, oh, it's the Center for World Culture at Moscow State University. But his specialty is Byzantine art, and then out of that, he, he coined a term that's actually in the Cambridge Dictionary of Christianity now called hiertopy, mm -hmm. which I told him that wasn't necessarily gonna catch on outside <laughs> of certain circles. But, um, but it's a, it means sacred space. Yes. And, and his point is that it all works together, mm -hmm. and that, that sacred spaces, He's made a big argument and a strong argument that they should be recognized as a human art form. Mm -hmm. And he, he sees a lot of film and also installation art as a kind of secular materialist longing mm -hmm. for the kind of sacred space that the church has created. Mm -hmm. So it's that, that all the pieces work together and that's, that's part of what Peter's talking about. Right, right. When you come into an old church of being faithful to what is good and true mm -hmm. there and at the same time, needing to have a, a conversation with with today yes. that will mm -hmm. now become part of the fabric for 200 years from now. Yes, yes. If Christ doesn't come, that, that you've now added to this, it's almost like the space is a tapestry that you're adding, oh, yes. that you're participating right. in. Yeah. Right. And and it's 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 an important thing, the, the, the sure, working yeah. together, and that's something you have, that yeah. people you like must. Peter and Maya yeah. think about. But those churches well. are layers, yeah. they are layers, you know, <clears throat> because uh, any church, uh, we have a, a Christian poet in Denmark called Grundtvig, who was a, as important as the Danish philosopher uh, Kierkegaard. And Grundtvig, he founded uh, the schools for peasants when they were 20, 30, 40 years old, they could go to a school that was invented in 1840 in Denmark. And it still exists, it's called the high school, Danish, where anyone can come in and get uh, yeah. uh, knowledge about great things without paying for it first of all, and also without looking at his age and his background. You know. yeah. mm. and, uh, but he, he said that any church is made of human stones, which is true, of course. Mm. And he thought that all the traces that you have from every period leaves you uh, like, mm. you know, one layer on top of the next mm. layer. Mm. So you can see what you have left from that generation. And any old church, now we're not talking about new church, should have that kind of layers so we can, uh, so like an archaeologist, when he starts to dig in the ground, then he knows now I'm in the 12th and the 16th and the 5th and 4th century, etc. And this is what happened in that period. Yeah. And the same layers you have in the churches, that this is from that period, this is from that period. Yeah. And you should continue 
anyone who is Christian and who has a church and is connected to a church has, in my opinion, an obligation to continue to put on those layers. Mm -hmm. And uh, because this, uh, Christ's time is not that far away. It's only 80 generations, I used to say. People don't think that. Yeah. Because you have mm -hmm. four generations on one century and it's 20 centuries ago. So 80 generations ago, you had Christ sitting here next to us. Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, so this is interesting that the time, and those layers tell us about that uh, in a way very short time. So also putting layers on and on again is also a way of going the other way back, mm -hmm. that you suddenly come mm -hmm. close to him backwards. Mm -hmm. So you work and you walk forwards, but you also come backwards, you know, mm -hmm. which is important. I think. Those layers are living witnesses. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. I was telling a, a, a person who was one of our managers yesterday, and he's, they're Californians, you know, and a lot of people never leave Southern California because you can go from the beach to skiing in one day, why would you leave? And his, his, his wife went on a school trip with one of their daughters to Italy, and. Mm -hmm got a taste for something more than California, which was comforting. So he's, yesterday he just said to me, you know, Carrie and I are thinking about traveling and, uh, more, and uh, something came up about France, I can't remember now. And he said, you like France, didn't you? And I said, oh, you've got to go to France. And, uh, and they're believers, and last summer we had a really, I would say, um, supernaturally blessed time in France. Um, and, and but there's a there are a lot of things there from the fourth century oh, yeah. which people don't think of. And France in the fourth and fifth century was really one of the strongest p parts oh, yeah. of the Christian oh, yeah. church. Oh, yeah. And building churches were being built, and yeah. great saints were living and wit I mean witnessing. It was just an amazing time. And we followed that last summer. Rainus mm -hmm. was the mm -hmm. bishop of Lyon. Yeah, and he was a very important. Very person. important. And in and Hilary of Arles mm -hmm. and Hilary of uh, Poitiers, who was at the Nicene Council in 325, mm -hmm. and and then and then he mentored Gregory of Tours and the mm -hmm. communities and all that. And um, and I just got talking about and I talked about Saint Sarah and Saint Santorinus in Toulouse, because we we stumbled all into Toulouse. And I'd never been there. And Toulouse, you can actually see how it was laid out in the, the what they call the medieval dark ages, which were not very dark from my experience of traveling. Um, the whole city was laid out with the churches, so the whole place was claimed for God. And these places were beautiful, and many of them were still there. You can walk. And when I was telling you about it, I, all of a sudden I choked up, mm -hmm. and I had I just started to cry. Mm -hmm. And I said, Kirk, those are the witnesses of our brothers and sisters yes, yeah. who lived and died our faith. Mm -hmm. And you can go there and you can, you can hear their witness and see it. Mm -hmm. They wrote it in stone and glass mm -hmm. and, um, and all the, and metal. Yeah, and they yeah, left yeah. us. This, yeah. is, this is our heritage of our brothers and sisters that yeah. they've left to us. And when, when we did our chapel, mm -hmm. Peter and Maya gave us some bricks from, I think, a 13th century mm -hmm. Danish mm -hmm. church, but they'd been involved in, in, in the renovation with... There was something that was supposed to be thrown out, so we... Because uh, they made a new rescu floor. Yeah. We rescued yeah. that. Oh, yes. And those bricks are, are now part of your oh. chapel. You know? And they're a cross. We, yes, our yes. architect yeah. got it. Yes. And, and so <laughs> the, the floor is this cross mm -hmm. and, and then we also we had been to visit St. Minas monastery in um, Egypt which for 600 years was a major pilgrim destination yeah. for the Christian church right, right. and they are remaking the little the the um, terracotta vials that they would yeah. put oil in from the, mm -hmm. the from there mm -hmm. and we have that in the wall mm -hmm. as a yeah. connecting yeah. The Danes are bearing witness yeah. at the same time that the Egyptian Christians yeah. were bearing right. witness. Right. And here we are together about with the layers mm -hmm. we're talking mm -hmm. about. And then we bring uh, in our contemporary yes. view of it. Yeah. I think that the churches that I've been in in Europe, like the um, pilgrimage sites in Le Puy en Valais, have contemporary oh, art yeah. in there oh, yeah. as well oh, as yeah. the ancient oh, stuff. Yeah. And so it's done stuff. so yeah. exactly, and yeah. it's done so beautifully. I don't see that as often here. I think one of the challenges is that our we're churches. We're not as old. 
Or it will, of course. Well, we don't but, have those but old churches. We don't yet, have the vision. But still, yes. But we don't we don't build with the quality. Yep. Oh. And and we have a throwaway culture. For yep. us in California, a forty year old building is an old building. Mm -hmm. And I mean that's <laughs> that's quite laughable. Right. But it's true, the churches are, you know, um, there isn't a, there isn't a sense that we're building something for Eternity. For eternity and something is, that is, is worth I think investing that, in. I think also the community has an obligation against uh, yeah. towards these old churches. And I remember there was uh, one of the bishops in Denmark who was bishop in the Cathedral of Aarhus, which is a very big church also from the 14th century, and they have all these layers we are talking about. And he mm -hmm. said, I'm so sad because in my time as a bishop, I haven't done anything to the church. Uh, mm, not quite mission. so, he said. Mm -hmm. And then when I'm going up to God and he asks me, what did you do to your church in Europe here? Then I must <coughs> look down on the ground and say, I did new heating systems <coughs> and new earphones. <laughs> <laughs> well, those things are important and, if you and can't And he, he was so sad but. that he couldn't say anything else than that. Couldn't say anything else and well. of course, if we have to look at it in a pragmatic way, if people are freezing in the yeah. churches, yeah. it's not so funny. Okay. And if yeah. they cannot hear what the priest says, it's not it's funny so either. Yeah. But it is important to have those layers, in my and, opinion. And the yes. interesting <laughs> thing, too, is that we have money for sound systems and right. projection systems, yes. right. which are incredibly expensive. But we're asking artists to donate their work mm. and, oh, yeah. uh, and aren't true, willing yes. to pay Well, we have that problem in Denmark, too, also a little yeah. bit. Right. It's, it's considered superfluous. Yes, yes. yes. It's, and it, it's, it's it, so it upside not. down from yeah from the Christian church yeah. historically. Yeah. Right. The Christians yeah. understood that this yeah. was a gift for God mm -hmm. and, and, and also for each other to bring us closer yeah. to Him yeah. right. and right. to know Him through, exactly. through, through the beauty that, yeah. that is a part of Him. And also, we're created in His image, mm -hmm. which means mm -hmm. we are creators in each of our different ways and artists right. have, right. A, you know, that's, that is their great creativity and gift to the mm -hmm. world. It's a gift mm -hmm. to the world. Right. I mean, what do people right. go to see in Europe? Yeah. The churches. They do. Yeah. They do. The churches. In Denmark, we have, in a, a small country with only six million inhabitants, we have 3,000 churches, and half of them are from the Middle Ages, which is a, mm -hmm. a fortune to have, you know. But uh, to go back to talk about what can we do for message with the new art in the churches, and how can that message be received also by the people? Uh, there, uh, we, we, I have had a discussion with a person who is a specialist in Kierkegaard. And Kierkegaard was this great Danish philosopher right. that I like, of course. And he, he was not very artistic. He had no sense for art, right. but he had the sense for the face and for the words and for uh, the devotion, you know. Right. And uh, he collected himself things that would be like Disney art today that he had in his room. And then he loved to have cups, you know, where he had served warm chocolate in with small painted motives from Copenhagen. And he had a collection of about 40 different motives. So he asked his, uh, he had a waiter who took care of him, uh, what are we going to drink from today? The Christian Borg Castle or the church of this or that and that? Uh, was his joy of looking at pictures. And then he says one thing which is of course interesting that that uh, he's against a crucifixion representation uh, right. to show the suffering of a person on a cross. And he's against that because uh, the person who looks at that, who could be ignorant about the Bible or could be ignorant about the New Testament, he doesn't know what is happening after he had been on the cross. Yeah. So it means that looking at a cross, seeing a person who is suffering there is a terrible thing. And in a way, it's not the end of Christianity. It's only part of it, he says. So when you just show a man on a cross, you should also show him resurrected in the same image. And this is not possible, he says. <laughs> so uh, that's so he why he's against, he's against a representation the, uh, of Christ on a cross, you know. Interesting, interesting. And then he says literature or anything that has to do with words can explain the before and the now and the after. But this is an art that cannot do that. And uh, this is that, his point, you see. Right. And uh, then, of course, uh, I have been very intrigued by this and have tried to see what can you do which has 
uh, uh, answer to that. Right. Uh, because I don't agree with him that it should not be possible, you know. Yeah. And then, for instance, stained glass windows is one thing which is very important. Mm -hmm. And when I did my stained glass windows for the Wailo Church, yes. where I have motives from the Old and the New Testament, there the fact that you have a window with a motive on is uh, the factual thing that you see and you can touch it even. But then there's something else, yeah. which is when the light comes, then it yes. transforms these windows yes. to pictures that start to move. And it moves on the walls, it means there you see the reflections where you only see the shadows mm -hmm. of the, what I did on the windows itself. Right. But it also gives you the feeling that there is something else than just yeah, what nice. you can touch. And, and in that window. And this is, yeah. a, this is a transcendency that we yes, were talking yes. about, which is so important in Christian art also, it. that yeah. suddenly yeah. you have Christ somewhere and you have uh, his presence somewhere, which is the light. It says the text also that he is a light. But there suddenly light becomes uh, something that you can touch with yes. your mind. You yes. know. But in and that window also, you do have both the crucifixion yeah. And the resurrection this in is the true. top part, and and, the, and so you you mm -hmm. include both of those things, and I think you and they are mingled uh, through the light, right? And on the reflections on the wall, right? So what he says that you stop in the second you show a picture is not true, because the light also starts in the morning, yes. and it goes on the whole changes day, it. and it changes uh, through the whole liturgical year, mm -hmm. and it changes also because people are getting older and older. So suddenly you have a movement in your reception of the images that is also moving in, in themselves, you know. Yeah. So uh, this is very important, I think, and that is one of the forces with exactly with, uh, with stained glass windows, yes. that they, uh, uh, so to say, uh, kill the time and makes it uh, eternity, you know. Yep. Yes, there's, yes, there's a does. great, another story out of the Vilo Church, yes. which maybe we'll get to mm -hmm. the process uh, mm -hmm. that you, mm -hmm. uh, um, how you approach a, a project. Mm -hmm. But um, and I had the privilege of meeting this person, mm -hmm. um, Henning. Oh, yes. And Henning was one of the council. Yes. And Vilo Church is built in a part of Copenhagen that wasn't in Copenhagen, no. when, oh, 100 years ago. Right. Um, and so the community grew, and, and being Danes, they needed a church. Yes. And so they crammed it in between the freeway and the shopping mall, but still. The supermarket, yes. The supermarket, yes. And so, but still, this yeah. is, there it is. And, and, they, and they went after a prominent architect. It was his last major project um, and, a, and a prominent artist. However, Peter presented, and you'll, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce this and you take over, yeah. um, but Henning, some of the council weren't excited about this, let's just put it that way. Uh -huh. And one of the people who was especially not excited was Henning. Yes. And, um, and he was vocal as, well, he told me he was vocal against it. Oh, yeah. But the day that we got in, which is a story in itself, which I'll spare you because it would take the whole conversation, um, we got, it, it was Henning who let me and the people I was there with who would come back um, to see it, uh, took us in, and he told us the story and the meaning of the art and the, um, uh, and the, and the windows, and there, there's a head of Christ bowed. And uh, I'll never forget Henning saying, it's bowed with the crown of thorns um, coming out of the wall. And, uh, and there's no body, of course. And, um, and Henning, Henning was, I, I think one of us asked why no body, and Henning, Henning said, well, it's very clear. They had, we are the body of Christ. You and you and you, we gathered are the body of Christ. Yeah. That's the mm -hmm. message. Mm -hmm. we all went, oh. I mean, it gives me tingles now to even tell the story. Mm -hmm. But Henning, mm -hmm. who was against it, yeah. became the person who was he so loved proud. His, he loved his oh. job to be able to open the church for people who yeah. wanted to see it. Yeah. And he, he loved it, and he got it mm -hmm. on a profound mm -hmm. way. So, so yeah. maybe you could so, talk no, about the true, process yeah. when you engage. Well, the process, yes, yes. was that uh, in, in Denmark we have a democratic country, so every church has a council which is elected for four years. And after those four years, they have to be re-elected or they, they will be thrown out. And, uh, and then they have the full 
there are 12 people in each church and they have the full, um, so to say, right to decide what to put in the church. It doesn't mean that if someone has made something in a church, which has happened in Denmark, uh, and it is finished, and it, then the new council that come can throw it out. <laughs> uh, you cannot throw anything wow. out from Danish churches which is more than 50 years old. Okay. But in the first 50 years, you are free years. to just throw it out. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And this has happened with prominent Danish artists. And then they came back again. <laughs> The next council yes, brought it back. Yes. I love it, I love it. <laughs> so, so this is a rather vivid to right. say that, yes. But then what happened was that uh, then they take me in oath and ask me what are you going to do. And of course you have to do sketches and things like that, but you as an artist you know very well that sketches is one thing and the reality is mm -hmm. another. Mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, my opinion is that you do, should not make the sketches too vivid and too real. Because then people, if it doesn't look like that later yeah. on, they stay yeah. on you yeah, and say, well, it doesn't point. look yes. like what you told us and showed us to begin right. with. Yeah. Right. So if you can blur it out a little oh. bit, <laughs> it wouldn't be bad because then you can always, but uh, I can handle that also. But anyhow, here we had half of the council who liked a lot of what I did and the other who didn't like. And then we tried to agree on a few things, but then exec exceptionally this head, you know, yeah. It, all didn't like, and including him, and he used that as a reason maybe to even make me not make the church, you know. So I, I agreed on not making that head. Uh -huh. uh, but then what I did was that the day before the opening where we had the Minister of Culture, who is also in Denmark the Minister of Church, because Denmark is a state church. We have the Lutheran is a state church there. And then we had the bishop of uh, that area, and then we had the television on, the main television. Of the, and that was 10 o'clock in the morning. And I had the keys to that church. And I had made a plan there that I opened the church about 11 o'clock in the night. And there I worked with eight people. And that head is heavy because it's 800 kilos huh? and it's high up. Yeah, so I had it put in the church. Mm -hmm. And uh, everything finished around whitewashed the wall where we had put it on, et cetera, and took away the scaffolding. And we finished exactly 7.30 in the morning. And there, the first people started to come to prepare everything for, for the big opening day. And then, of course, it was too late to take it down. And everyone was shocked, you know, from the community, including Mr. Henning. And they said, yeah, we'll never forgive you that. But then a few days after, they all agreed on it, it was great, you know. So I can recommend any artist to do what the community doesn't say he should do because he has to follow his own feelings and heart yes. at the end and that yes. would give a good result, you know. Yes, I think that's a really important point. Mm. Um, you're working with a client mm. um, and we don't have a state church, but mm. you know, you're working with a, com a committee usually, a client, so you've got to please them, but it's... Um, you can end up with a real mess if you, mm -hmm. if, if, you know, because they're hiring you. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's a spiritual process. Mm -hmm. This isn't just something you pull out of your head. It, no. it comes from a spiritual place. Mm -hmm. And they have to trust you as the artist, mm -hmm. but as a person of faith yes. and, and who is collaborating with the Holy Spirit. Yes. And so I think that's an important thing to remember. How did you come up with the motives, Peter? Did they give you any direction? Or no, 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 no. They no. asked you, what would you do? What yes, would you, do? You, had the, you had the Arctic yes. textural drawings, yes. uh, the Woolard's drawings, or, or, you, or you talked to him oh, too? Or? Well, I did talk a lot with him because uh, he, he was uh, open-minded to change many things, which we did also in the construction, you know. But uh, yeah. Well, uh, I would like to talk about this, the relationship between art and, and the public or the people. Okay. In the, when yes. I did last year a new church in Norway, the highest point of Norway near North yes. Camp, and the I had the privilege to have Roberta coming from uh, Los Angeles to the opening there. 
and the Norwegian princess was there also, and all the laps and the Norwegians. Are there. It was a beautiful day. It was glorious. This is, this is the Very cathedral cool. of the Northern oh, Lights. Yes. And yes. it's on the northern there, tip yes. of Norway. Oh, yeah. So and the it's climate a, it's a and everything, high point, lights huh? and all of that. It's, yes. yeah. it's on the same length of the middle of Greenland. Yeah. People don't know that it's that high up. So it is, yes. uh, I, I suppose I have been told that this is the highest placed church in the world of that size. Mm -hmm. uh, it is for sure. It's There's church. no church other with that size yeah. so high up north. Yeah. So you, you have, have all of these people coming. From yes. And you have all to fly. Over. You fly to a place above the Arctic Circle and change planes to fly up, fly there. up there. That's so when. That's really when I realized this is really yes. north. Yes. So, so you're yeah. when you're doing a creative process for something like that, context mm. again is important in in oh, the yeah. location. Oh yeah. And so uh, what happened there was that they needed a church again because during the war the Germans had this as a yeah. base, you see. Yeah. And as it's be beyond the wood area, yeah. you don't have many trees up there. Oh. Uh, then uh, they couldn't make their landing uh, base there for their aircrafts on the rocks and they couldn't explode the rocks in a way so it could be proper. So they took all the wooden houses up there, including the wooden churches, and they just mm -hmm. teared them down. And then they used all the wood to make a landing and a starting lane for the aircraft. So after the war, uh, all those churches disappeared. There was a need in the village and again a longing like we started to talk about to do something. And there was a man who was there with the opening he was 86 years old, yeah, yeah. and he was the one who worked hard every year to get raise the money to make that church, and finally they did it, you know. And that's why it is proportionally maybe too big for the village because it's not yeah. so big of a town, but then it became also a symbol for them. Yeah. And there, of course, again I met the community and we had many discussions, and uh, there I could feel that they had a need for this church, and that meant also that their expectations for what I was going to do and not do were very big, you know, and great. Mm -hmm. And also very critical because they have for years waited for that church. Yeah. So they had to have time to build up in their mind ideas about what should it be and not be. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this uh, you are up to, you know, in such a situation. But then I created something that was around the idea that you have the light there half of the year and then you have the darkness half of the year. And this again has to do with Christianity, that you have a period of darkness and you have a period of light also. And when Easter time comes up, the light comes back also. So I made a huge sculpture, about five meter tall of Christ, with the arms out, and then he looks up. And not down, which is new, you know. Mm -hmm. Roberta has in her chapel here uh, that I made for a statue with the same motive, which yeah. is where I started to do that motive. But uh, in art history, it's not very common. There are very, very few examples that you see Christ crucified looking up. Mm -hmm. There's and a Stanley Spencer painting. Yes, and if not, there's not, not very many. much. No. no. And my idea was, of course, that I think this person being chosen by God to represent us on earth and take the, once for all the sins on his shoulders and being uh, offered, you know, on the altar, so to say, or on the cross, uh, this person uh, would say thank you to be chosen for that job. Mm -hmm. So he looks up to God and he puts out his arms, who are suddenly not the suffering arms that he puts out, but are the blessing arms where he embraces the people in front of him mm -hmm. and God and say thank you because you choose me. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, was a very strong image and uh, uh, then at the same time I made the sculpture in bronze, dark brown to begin with and then it becomes more and more light up and in that way it becomes also uh, the, the bringer of light of course, mm -hmm. which is so important for the people living up there in darkness also. And then I placed him on the circle which is a boat because as there are many generations back fishermen, then Christ comes in a boat to them and then it is also of course, uh, an allusion to the Nike of Semutrek in, in the Louvre Museum, where you have this victory statue standing on a boat, yeah. because Christ mm -hmm. is also the victory. Mm -hmm. And uh, But then one of the persons in the committee said to me, Peter, I think your symbol is all right and beautiful and all this, but I cannot accept that. And I said, well, give me a good reason for that. And she said, well, uh, my husband committed suicide two years ago. Mm -hmm. And when I came in, 
the room where he had hanged himself. Oh, no. Uh, something happened not normally when people are hanged. I can understand this is terrible to talk about. But his head was bent backwards. Mm. Like and Christ I won't up. be able and to come into this church mm. and look at this image with the head backward. Then I will have, and then of course, uh, this was a very um, uh, morally difficult question for me. Because should I accept yeah. her sufferings and try to do, or should I do what I thought as an artist was the most important thing to do? And uh, we started to have a dialogue, and also the rest of the people in there. And then I, I came to this solution, or whatever you would call it. I said to her, I think if you think about a church and the whole thing that happens there, it has to do with salvation and uh, also with hope and help. Then you have to accept and face what has been so terrible for you. And your face should make you forget what happened. And maybe it's even a very important thing that you stand yes. facing this. Yes. And I mean Christianity has to do with that also. Absolutely. It is not a security okay. control or no. uh, another of Obama's uh, plans to help people with security services that you go to church. Uh, church is not a security key that you get. No. It is something where you have to struggle. And that struggle is also what she had to do with this yeah. problem she had. Yes. And uh, there, uh, this is what art can do in the church yes. also. Eventually. Yes, it brings it, it, it brings the um, healing to yes, that place. Yes. And really, when we're afraid to see something, mm -hmm. it's usually because there's something deep down that yes. needs to be brought into yes. the light. Yes. And so for her, it became an opportunity to mm -hmm. work through that yes. and find healing. Um, well, I, I would later hope. on, I got a letter yeah. from her that she started to come to the church. And uh, mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. it is uh, kind of a little happy ending uh, in a way. And she. Yeah she realized that, um, that she, she could, by her face, come over what she had been yes. through, yes. you know. I, I think one of the things I appreciate about your artwork so much, as I read through this book um, on, on that church, by the, uh, church, by the church yeah. uh, is that the windows depict suffering. They, they're yeah. the difficult stories. That, yes. um, uh, Cain killing Abel and the sacrifice of Isaac and Job and um, Lazarus and being. Lazarus yes and and Christ in Gethsemane right, right Christ in Gethsemane uh, th they uh, do that and it connects uh, with our suffering mm -hmm. it's very real and honest and the beauty of it is you have these these black painted um, drawings or paintings that are that are visceral. Mm -hmm. They're they're very very strong and uh, emotional, and they're layered over these deep, gorgeous colors of blown glass. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for me, the experience, and I I hope, Lord willing, I can get into the church and experience it in that space. But for me, what it did is to say there is redemption in the suffering. And, and there is hope, mm -hmm. and there's beauty even, mm -hmm. because in that place of suffering, we're opened up, and God can come in and, mm -hmm. and speak to us in a way that we're not open when things are just, you know, going. And it also says, I think, to the world, an evangelistic message that, um, that our faith is real. Mm -hmm. It isn't pie in the sky, happy feelings, um, mm -hmm. you know, just butterflies and flowers. It's about suffering mm -hmm. and so, on some of the most profound levels and that God is big enough to journey with us over time in this salvation history mm -hmm. and bring us to this point mm -hmm. where the glorious resurrection and the hope mm -hmm. of the resurrection for all of us. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that it, it is, for, it, for me, was profoundly mm -hmm. comforting. Yeah. And so we, we don't often put oh. those things together. We want to hide the difficult. But you go through Holy Week to get yeah. to Easter. Yeah. And so I, I think your work is, is, uh, captures that, not just in the stories and mm -hmm. uh, the images themselves, but there, there's a, so much symbolism mm -hmm. and that we have to work our way through, which we have to work through life. 
and also in um, and just the way it's painted is is mm -hmm. an emotional thing. I would imagine, and we haven't talked very much about your process, mm -hmm. but I would imagine um, as doing art is like giving birth. It's painful, and you have to go to those places mm -hmm. to be able to produce that kind yeah. of work. Can you talk a little bit about what that's uh, like for you? I, I will, yes. Well, I might first uh, put a point to what you said about these paintings and the mm -hmm. sufferings mm -hmm. and and resurrection that I made a new church this last autumn in uh, in Denmark in Weile that you have not seen. No. And uh, this was a church what, that was built in the 50s in Gap. Denmark with dark red bricks. Mm -hmm. And there, the architect, uh, who was a well-known architect, he had time to do 30 churches in Denmark. His wow. name is Helge Jensen. Wow. And uh, he was well known for his churches, but he didn't want any art in his churches. In what era is this? Uh, that is in the 50s. The, okay. From 51 till uh, 62, he, he so did all these okay. churches. Very high right. modern. Yes. High modern. And then uh, he was against mm -hmm. anything that was artistic. It would be only the light and the space that had to be the main wow. thing. And then uh, this community asked me to come and see their church, which I did about five years ago. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I saw was the altar. And behind the altar, you had uh, a wall which was 15 meter long and nine meter tall, and bowed a little bit like that with only red bricks. <laughs> and, uh, and can you imagine? You know, you come in and you look at that, and then uh, I, I, the first reaction I had, I said, I saw that the Berlin Wall had been turned down, <laughs> uh, but I can see it's still here in this church. <laughs> And they, some liked it and some didn't yeah, like yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Some people, yeah, yeah didn't care yeah. for that, Peter. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then I said, you have to tear that wall down and open it up, not maybe directly, but with an artwork. So this thing that happens in this church does not end behind the altar with this wall. With the brick wall. Uh, and of course, it was a little bit uh, part of the Lutheran tradition that the word was the most important right. thing. Mm -hmm. And that images right. maybe should not play that important role. Right. And this, of course, was his idea. So I thought about it and I ended up making a wall of gold, mm. which is a very Byzantine way. Yes. And I made it relief on the whole wall, which is the biggest golden relief in Denmark now, wow. where I had uh, someone working on it for two years, you see. I did the whole uh, decorations in my uh, in plaster, and then I was made form of it, and then we cast it in a, a very tough, hard plaster. And then we put uh, 50 uh, sections of each, 2 meter and 50 by 150, in, next to each other. And that made a huge pattern that was gilded with 24 karat gold. And uh, this wall has as one of the main motives drops, teardrops coming down all over. There are about 400 teardrops falling down the wall. But at the same time, it's also, of course, the grains of uh, Christ who is sowing his grains for new plants to come up, a new life to come mm. up. Mm. And also, and of course, and yeah. of course, it's also uh, the tongues of fire that you have around Easter time. That's right. And of course, it's also the drops of Christ's blood that becomes light, you know, because it changes. And suddenly, and in the middle of that, I have made a huge painting which is six and a half meter tall and about three meter broad with Christ as the man who sows. So he hangs still on the cross and then one arm comes down and the other one is still hanging up. And the one that comes down, opens his hand and then the grain comes out. So all the grains you have in this huge wall uh, are the new uh, grains sowing them. The and then I made an altar in bronze, which is an open It is tape. very Byzantine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it is. And I made an altar, uh, which is in bronze, open. Mm -hmm. But this I made in the way that I did do two candles, part of the tape. So the whole table is one block of bronze. And then the, the two uh, candeliers are also part of the table. So my idea was that the table is not supposed only to be the table for the Eucharistic meal, but it is also to be the candle that is the light for the future, you yeah. see. Mm -hmm. So the, suddenly the altar became one huge uh, candlelight. And under it I have made a box of glass. And in that box of glass I have cut out the shape of Christ lying there. But, and then I put it together again after I cut the glass out with the lead, 
and the letter have gilded so and it is a glass which is invisible it is this new museum glass I have used mm. so you have a line of the body of Christ lying under the table which is a golden line wow. that in that way tells about what has been is now uh, resurrected and being uh, yeah. distributed by sewing them mm. and uh, but I mean this is to tell that it is possible to show the suffering Yes. And also what comes after the suffering mm -hmm. in more or less one image. Wow. Uh, and, and this is also what is true in the reality. I mean, we are confronted with those problems and sufferings and all these things all the time. But at the same time, in the suffering is also the solution, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So these two things are, yes. are knitted very closely together. And using a, a symbolic language in the way you do, I mean, mm. coming up with your symbols that have mm. many layers of meaning, different mm -hmm. meanings woven into it, mm -hmm. then that um, allows us to come and God can be speaking to yeah. different people where where they are, people and it makes it so from different rich. places, yeah. and it makes it um, a, a universal language it as does, well. Yeah. Yeah. This area in Denmark is an yeah. area where you have a lot of uh, immigrants coming. So you have Muslims and you have uh, mm -hmm. Buddhists, and, and they are coming to the church, yeah. Yeah. which is interesting. There's a message that's there that's different yeah. from their yeah. messages. Yeah. Yes. I think when we talk about um, uh, the resistance to art in the church and or where we're kind of stuck uh, here, especially in the United States, I think we're so... We tend to be pragmatic people, and um, I think evangelism, a, a lot of pastors are saying it's evangelism is the most important thing, or we, um, they don't see how beauty is going to lead to growth in the kingdom and bringing people into the kingdom. Mm -hmm. But what you're saying here is that, is that they do. And, and actually there are, um, uh, I just heard a keynote speaker at a major Catholic conference, mm -hmm. um, Father uh, Robert Bennett, his, on the new evangelism. The, uh, the, his first point was lead with beauty. He said, if you lead with truth, <coughs> they'll say, well, that's your truth. <coughs> and if you lead with goodness, well, that's, that's your, don't give me your, your morality. <laughs> yeah, don't give me your morality. Mm -hmm. But beauty is something that speaks to us so deeply, and I think that it and it draws us and it causes us to mm -hmm. to do the work, to f to find that mm -hmm. that thing that we're, it touches on that longing, mm -hmm. and I think that your work, um, <coughs> me. being as symbolic as it is and having the beauty, allows people to come in and and find that. Do you find that people are drawn to the churches because of uh, the art? Benedict the Sixteenth. I'll yeah. interject this, mm -hmm. and Peter mm -hmm. can take over. But Benedict the Sixteenth said, he said it before he was Benedict the Sixteenth, um, that the two greatest witnesses to the Christian gospel in the world are her saints and her art. Mm -hmm. Um, because they speak to the heart and the mind, but they speak to the whole person. Mm -hmm. um, I'm adding that part. He didn't put it quite that way. <laughs> but, but they are. They're the things that draw you. Yeah. And, and Jonathan Edwards said it. Yeah. If the Protestants want a Protestant, mm -hmm. he's, his, he's the Protestant of all Protestants in America. Mm -hmm. He understood mm -hmm. God's loveliness is what will draw people to him. And what people see when they go in and people go to the churches. Mm -hmm. I mean, we went to see Vilo Church mm -hmm. because of the art. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I mean, I go and look at churches and yeah. drive, you know that I'm a church yeah, junkie, yeah, but, um, <laughs> but, but, and, but, but it was because of the art. If yes. there, I mean, I haven't been to this church in Aarhus because, well, there was nothing there Only the heat, other than the bricks. Heating system, yeah. Yeah, the heating system and the uh, <laughs> earphones. And yeah, that's wonderful. But boy, that, makes, that means the preaching must be pretty good, you know, for people to keep, because we are, but We're it, embodied beings. We need more than... It could be the problem, as you say, the preaching is... Uh, because there's one a priest in Denmark who s blamed me and said, God save me that I never go to one of the churches you have made because I don't know what to say. Uh, <laughs> I took that as a compliment. Yes, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but absolutely. I mean, uh, 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 now you ask if people... 
Uh, the, the church we are talking about a lot now, Vilo, until now you have had about 290,000 people coming just to visit it. Mm. I mean, uh, without being the people who go say every, every Sunday. So this mm -hmm. is just, they even have a parking place for the buses coming there. Wow. And uh, so it's that's witness. nice. But yeah. uh, then, witness. of course, uh, one of the criticisms that we can meet doing those things is also from the, the church, also in Denmark, comes uh, with the point that the churches should not be museums. Right. And this, of course, is also a difficult problem that you have to face because it could be museums, and this is not the case. It is a place for uh, uh, your uh, faith, and it is a place where you should gather in a community and, and get this uh, blessing that the church and the message is, and not just like any other museum. No. And right. uh, then right. uh, what is then the difference between it being a museum and, uh, and, and a church? And uh, I think it has to do with what you do then, because if the message of the artwork in the church is a Christian message in whatever form it has, then it does not stay in the, in the line of being a museum show. But right. when it becomes whatever, you know, and even people, artists who say, I don't believe in anything, not even in, in Christ or whatsoever, uh, but I like to put my painting or my sculpture or my artwork in this church. Then he's working on that idea that the museum becomes a museum, that the church it's, it's becomes a museum, a museum mm -hmm. which is dangerous, you know. It is. And that yeah. could be one of the reasons mm -hmm. that you should make sure that what you put in has to do with Christianity. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm a little bit against also that idea because even Grunewald's, uh, the, the, the beautiful uh, altarpiece he has made in Col Colmar, Colmar, which is considered a great Christian artwork. We don't know uh, Grunewald. We don't know if he was a bad guy. We don't know if he was doing bad things. Uh, or any, We don't even know if he went to the mass or if he went into church. But then again, I use this expression that from the work you see he has done, you can see that he must it have been Christian. Down. Mm -hmm. This is not possible to do this if he wasn't a believer in one or the other way, you know. And um, then uh, again, uh, I think that... This is what I thought when I saw Vilo and I saw your work. Yes, well, it's true. This is, this is, this has There's an artist who believes in Jesus Christ in Denmark. <laughs> I mean, because Denmark has yeah, this yeah. kind of... You yeah. know, it's, uh, yeah. if you're to the ignorant reputation of this free, this, yeah. you know, whatever. Anyway, it's true, and I yeah. thought, whoa. But then I think also that Denmark being a Lutheran or Protestant country, 71% uh, of the population are Lutherans. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, he was fighting for the word and the message of the word should go through. Mm -hmm. And that was in a period where people started to read yeah. and started to n know their own local languages mm -hmm. where they had been put in a situation that they couldn't read and they couldn't really understand what was said in the churches and whatsoever. So there it was uh, really a revolution that the word came to them. Yes. They had already had all the images of the saints yeah. and the paintings right. and the right. altarpiece, right. but they, they yeah. hadn't got the word really. Mm -hmm. And then they had this need, and we started to talk about longing, they had this longing yeah. for the word also. Yes. And yes. now we are living in a new time. We are living in a time where the computerized world, the image world has taken over again. Yeah. The word disappears more and more, to be honest. Yes. And it yes. means that if you have to be able to come in contact with people, today, you have to use the pictures also. To do the image. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure that the words have the same strengths in the mind of people as it used to have, but no. the images have. Mm -hmm. Maybe 150 or 200 years or yes. 300 years from now, mm -hmm. people will long for words again. Oh, I hope so. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but, but right now we live in a time when if, if you don't speak through images, oh. you aren't going to be right. heard. No. Right. And then again, if we look at the New Testament and we look what is going on there, it is images a lot. Oh, yeah. I mean, you story. have very yeah, few things which the are abstract. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, I yeah. mean, uh, walking on the sea, turning the water to wine, yeah. uh, healing the blind, and uh, taking bread that can be multiplied, and all this. This has to do with images. Yes. yes. And uh, and uh, people can understand them when uh, laser sudden comes out of the tomb. We uh, can then see it's, that. Then uh, it's also something we yes. try to see. And crucified on the cross as images. Uh, and there's only maybe when he's standing on the, the, the speech he has on the rock, which is rather abstract. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a few so other things, especially in St. John's uh, Evangel. Yes. But if not, it is really images, right. most of it. Right. It's a, a great um, privilege for us as artists and a, a great uh, resource to put, it's such a small word that doesn't even begin to capture it. But, um, but what a, a thrill to, to be able to, to do art of this, this way and connect uh, what is most important to us. Thank you so much. Um, for, for your time and sharing of yourself and Roberta, all, all that you have done to bring these artists to our attention and, and to bring them here so we can benefit and um, our lives pleasure. are enriched. Thank mm -hmm. you.